You're listening to 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective Podcast. A new era of East Carolina football is here and will begin on August 31st when Mike Houston leads the Pirates into action at NC State. Between now and then, join us for a daily trip down memory lane as we experience Pirate football through the words of men who made those memorable moments happen. Here's your host, Bubba Rosenbaum. Welcome to the Sports Objective Podcast, our 50 Pirates in 50 Days series. And we've caught up with a number of guys from the Pat Dye era, um, the likes of Tony Collins, Terry Gallagher. And now we're very excited to catch up one, with one of the offensive linemen from that era, Wayne Inman. Wayne, welcome into the show. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. We appreciate your time. Uh, really appreciate you back in December of last year coming out to the uh, 40th anniversary uh, party for that 1978 team you were a part of. Uh, so let's just go back. Uh, I know you played at ECU uh, 76 to to 80 or 77 to 80. So take us back to the mid-70s and tell us how you wound up in Greenville. Oh, well, um that's, that's a pretty neat story within itself. I, uh, I I had played high school ball at Southview High School in Hope Mills, North Carolina, and, and uh, we weren't very good at the time. I think we won one football game that year, beat Scotland County, first game of the year, and then lost nine in a row. Uh, at the time, I, you know, I had been recruited by several colleges, but uh, it, it sort of all went south after the season was over, and um, – as a matter of fact, I had pretty much given up on playing college football, and uh, I had been offered a partial scholarship to go to Catawba uh, College at the time in Salisbury, North Carolina, and and, uh, and then I, I was sort of discouraged. I was going to join the Navy, and uh, me and my best friend were going to go into the Navy as as, as a, uh, on on the buddy system, and uh, at the time when I graduated from high school, I wasn't 17, and uh, my dad wouldn't sign for me. As a matter of fact, I, I was so upset at my dad. Uh, I probably didn't speak to him for you know for months or so, and uh, because I felt like he was keeping me from doing what I really wanted to do. Uh, he told me if I wanted to join the Navy, that uh, when I turned 18, I, I was welcome to join. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I got a phone call, and um, because a young man didn't graduate from uh, from high school, uh, they had an opening. Uh, in the East-West All-Star Game here in North Carolina, and which is played uh, in the last week of July, and they offered me an opportunity to play in the All-Star Game, and uh, so I accepted the offer and, and you know got in some decent shape, and I went to Greensboro to play in the All-Star Game, and uh, during the meantime, you know I've been contacted by Coach Landon Norris, who coached the secretary of East Carolina, was the uh, Recruiting, recruited our, our area, and um, Coach Norris had, had tried to convince me to walk on at East Carolina, and I, I, I just didn't feel like, you know, I felt like if I was good enough to go to college to play balls, and I felt like that he was good enough for a scholarship. And um, <clears throat> anyway, I played an all-star game, uh, and, and and played a decent game. And back in those days. Uh, college coaches could come to the game and watch the game and watch their players play. Uh, matter of fact, my teammates in the East-West game were players like Leander Green and Ruffin McNeil, uh, who, um, you know, all of us, you know, went to East Carolina together. So we had a, a pretty good football team back in those days and, uh, at the East-West game. But anyway, um, East Carolina had – signed a young man out of uh, 71st High School in Fedville. His name was Alvin Sparks, and Alvin academically uh, didn't meet the NCAA requirements, so was going to have to go to prep school, and so Coach Dye had an extra scholarship left. And uh, so he came down on the field after the game and uh, offered me a fourth scholarship to go to East Carolina. And this was like, I signed my scholarship to East Carolina August the 8th, 1976, and reported to camp, if I remember right, like um, August the 13th. So it was a, a very small window there. And uh, I got to East Carolina and, and um, sort of worked hard to try to figure it out. And, uh, uh, 
you know, and Jimbo Walker, you know, I was I was going to quit and come home because I didn't think it was. Uh, I was tired of getting my ass kicked every day. Excuse my language, but the thing about it was, was, was uh, you know, Jimbo was very supportive and told me that I was going to be a great football player at East Carolina. That I didn't need to go home. That I need to stay there and work through it and work through the grind. And and you know, thankful to Jimbo, I, I stayed and of course um, ended up having a, a pretty you know pretty good career and you know and had had the opportunity to make some uh, great friends at, at East Carolina as well. Tell us a little bit about uh, who your position coach was during those years. Uh, my position coach was uh, Dick Kupek. And Coach Kupek, uh, super, super nice guy, but he's a great, great football coach. And he, and I learned so much from Coach Kupek because it was uh, he was a, an attention to detail kind of guy. And, uh, I mean, he, he just stepped with a proper foot, proper angles, you know, head placement. All those things were things that, that uh Coach Kupak taught and uh, and he was uh very instrumental to uh to how I coach today and, and how I teach the game as from an offensive line standpoint. Great guy and, and uh had had a world of respect for Coach Kupak. So I know after arriving in East Carolina, like you said, um most linemen coming in like that, very very rarely do you see a lineman uh, play right off the bat and there's normally a a little, maybe a little bit more of a transition for a lineman compared to a skill guy. But um, I know in those years, uh, Wayne Bolt, uh, someone that we've had on the podcast and also went on to a tremendous uh, career in, in coaching at the FBS level. Um, and Wayne uh, was a tremendous lineman in his own right, and you had the opportunity to learn behind him. Well, well, Wayne, I, I, I was uh, – my red shirt freshman year, I was – I was back up to Wayne, and Wayne played right guard, and then you know, I backed Wayne up, and, uh, and then we had some injuries, and, and they moved Wayne to the left side, and I got a chance to start at the uh, right guard position, and you know that sort of gave me an opportunity to, uh, you know, to get a starting role, and you know from after that, it, the rest was history. I ended up starting and. I think I started 33 consecutive games while I was at college, and I graded out a winning performance all 33 games, which I, you know, was was pretty big because Coach Kupak spent a lot of time in grading the film, and you know whether you grade out a winning performance versus whether or not you didn't was was huge. And one of the goals that was set at, at the university or at football program was, you know, you wanted to, you know, grade a winning performance, and uh, so. You know that was a, that was a goal of mine is is to you know play the best I could and and try to try to, you know great winning performance every week. Wayne, well, during those years, so what what was your what was your playing weight? Because I know, I know linemen in that era weren't necessarily as big as they are today. So, uh. well, when when I got there, when my class of uh, and and uh, when Coach I got there, I think he he felt the need to start recruiting bigger linemen. You know and uh, when when I got there, I mean, you know, Wayne Bolt was a big guy, but Wayne right. then wasn't. Uh, you know, Wayne might have been six one, six two, and then you had Randy Parrish, who probably wasn't even six foot, and uh, uh, you know, our Matt Mulholland was one of the tackles, and Matt might have been six one. So, and and so I think when Coach Dye got there, he started recruiting. He started recruiting larger linemen. You know, six four, six five, six six type guys that that were, you know, bigger. Um, so my class that came in with Jeff Higgins, who was, uh, you know, bigger than Timmy Hightower, who's our center when I got there, and um, Higgins was was a bigger, bigger built guy, and Mitch Johnston was six five, and you know I was you know six four and a half, and you know then they recruited Tootie Robbins, you know, came in about six five, six six, and you know, he just started recruiting bigger kids. So uh, when I got to East Carolina, I, I probably weighed about 225. And uh, but you know, as as we worked out and I continued to grow, uh, you know, my playing weight was somewhere around 255 back then. I know in 1978 and 79, uh, per the ECU fact book, um, you had the honor of being named 
um, the the most outstanding um, offensive blocker, I believe was the name of the award. Um, but and then also in '79, you were named, uh, I believe, it was a third team All American. Uh, so, so uh, what were your memories of, of those honors? Well, um, <laughs> uh, this is funny to say. I, I was talking to my daughter last night. We were speaking, but about my, you know, being great and having great careers. I, I told her that, um, you know, be honest with you, I was a good football player that played on a great football team, and and. You know, I was just happened to be the one that got honored. They could have honored a lot of players, uh, I felt like, uh, off, off our football team. Um, I, I made, I was off South Independent two years, uh, at East Carolina, which back then, all South Independent included, you know, us and, and Miami and Florida State and, and, uh, University of South Carolina. All those schools were combined, you know, in, in the major independents. And right. So if you made an all independent team, which is pretty big in, in, in those days, uh, n- nothing like it is today, but, uh, so that, that was a big honor. And then, uh, and Coach Dye had called me to his office and, and told me that, uh, I was going, that he had, you know, um, recommended that I be considered as an all American. And, um, I never forget when it came out in the paper, um, my younger brother had come up to visit that Friday morning and he walked in my apartment and said, did you know you were an all American? I said, no, I didn't. He said, look at the paper. So that's how, that's how I found out. Well, uh, yeah, so that's something else. Um, that certainly changed a lot through the years. Cause I think back even to, uh, to my time, um, I mean, just, I guess it was about the mid nineties as far as, the internet really, really, uh, growing. And, um, uh, even then it wasn't but so good. Uh, so and as far as finding out things like that, uh, it, was, it was much different. And, uh, so taking a look at, at your career as a whole, I mean, what were, are there some games that really stand out? Obviously that 78 independence bowl was one that had to be uh, very memorable, but, uh, as far as some others, um, whether it's just team more team oriented, like you were saying a moment ago, or, your individual performance. So, what are some that really stand out? Well, you always uh, enjoyed competing on on the big stage. Uh, you know, playing at South Carolina was was big because you know they were a big time school, and um, a lot of times when we played South Carolina or played NC State or, or played Duke or uh, played Carolina. To, to them, we were just a warm-up game. To us, we were on the big stage and had the opportunity, you know, to to shine. And uh, the great thing about our football team back in those days, you know, we competed every week. And you had you had to prepare for us. If you didn't prepare for us, we'd beat you. And uh, and that's the way we approached it. I I, I remember it wasn't whether well, or not we were going to win or lose. It's how bad we were going to beat you. And, and so when we did lose back in those days it hurt i mean it hurt you you you'd sit there and and cry and your feelings were hurt because you had poured everything you had into this contest and and you had all the hard work and and a commitment that you had made toward it and then all of a sudden you know you come up a little short you know it hurt and it's supposed to hurt and uh so those kind of things and that's what's so great about the kids and guys that we i played with at east carolina everybody Everybody felt that way, and that had a lot to do with the coaching staff that coached I had and, and the young men that were working with us uh, to try to get the most out of us. It was, it was, it was an awesome time. Uh, but, you know, when, when you – you know, I, I guess a couple of games, the Carolina game we played and we had Carolina beat. Uh, I think the score was uh, – we were, we were up 24-21. Uh, we had the football and driving it. We came up short on the third down conversion, and and our defense was so good back then. I think they were ranked number two in the country. And Coach Dye made the decision to punt the football to them, and uh, we just hold them and win the ball game. And uh, they completed a uh, they played a you know a little post over the middle, and we tackled them. And of course, time was running short. They called a timeout and kicked a field goal, 47 yard field goal, and. Uh, a kid from over here, Wilmington Hoggard, is actually who kicked it, named uh, Jeff Arnold. And so they tied the ball game up 24-24. And back those days, you know, you didn't play overtime. And 
So then they kick an onside kick, and we were coached up front on the receiving team. As we, as soon as the ball was kicked, we went across and we blocked our guy that we, we were numbered up with. And so as soon as the ball was kicked, you took off. We were also coached if that ball, you know, come at you, you didn't touch it, you let the guys behind you field the ball and you blocked the guys in front of you. Well, when they kicked the onside kick, I was going across, you know, full speed to, to make contact with it, my opponent, and that ball just took a hop, and I remember it like slow motion. It just bounced and hit me right in the shin. And when the ball hit me in the shin, it flew up the field probably 10 or 12 yards. And, uh, I, I, you know, if I'd have scooped it and tried to run with it, I'd definitely put it in some field goal range. But I was always coached. You didn't try to pick it up. You just fell on it. So I did what I was taught to do, and I fell on the ball, and we ran. We had maybe 13 seconds to go, or whatever. And we ran a couple of plays, and then uh, Vern Davenport came in and attempted the field goal, and just came up a little short. So that that game was memorable because you know we we just played so hard, you know that game. That's so what in the open I mentioned Tony Collins. Obviously, he had a terrific career with the Pirates and then went on to uh, several excellent seasons with the New England Patriots. Uh, you referenced Leander Green, a uh, tremendous quarterback during that era. Uh, and then you also had the likes of Theodore Sutton, who's one of the top six or seven rushers uh, in terms of career yardage. Um, and then um, you also had explosive backs like Eddie Hicks. And then um, so um, with a with this stable uh, behind you uh, just just talk about um, the running game I know that was something that you guys had to you know, obviously it was just our bread and butter and what we did um, but that's something that you guys had to take a tremendous amount of pride in uh, ha- having uh, a guy like Theodore Sutton who uh, who still ranks highly in that area and then you also with Leander and Eddie um, had guys that had four touchdowns of 82 yards or more and that was something that really stood out well, you know, back then we ran the wishbone and 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 ran it very well. And you you, you always um, the biggest thing about the wishbone is is turnover. You you can't afford to turn it over, even when you you know you ride the fullback and and make the read and make the pitch. And it's it's, it's you got to be sound. And and uh, our coaching staff at that time just did an awesome job uh, in, in ball security. And, uh, so we very seldom ever put it on the ground. Uh, but, uh, we took pride coach Dye and his staff, uh, you know, they, they posted every week how many yards we rushed for and what our total yards was. I mean, we had those goals, those team goals that we had set and they had them posted up in the, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, team room. And so when you walked in there, you, you knew where you were and, uh, one year I think it was in '78 or '79. You know, we led the country in total offense, and I think we might have been number two in scoring offense. Average, I think we averaged maybe 37.4 points a game or something. And but uh, we didn't throw the ball a whole lot, but we threw it enough to keep you honest. We had, you know, uh, Terry Gallagher that y'all spoke with earlier, and you know, Terry was a great wide receiver, and not only. What, what people don't understand about Terry as well, Terry's a great blocker downfield. He'd, he'd lock on to somebody and, you know, they couldn't get away. And he did a great job. And then, you know, we had uh, Bill Ray. And, you know, Bill Ray was a good receiving tight end. He wasn't very good at blocking, but he was a great receiving tight end. And, you know, we'd fake the belly and, you know, it, it set up and Bill Ray would be right open on the seam. And well, we'd draw the linebacker in. But, you know, um, we didn't throw it much, but we threw it enough to be effective. And we'll throw it. We, we some, most time had big plays, you know, just like when Terry had those three catches for all these yards that time. I mean, they, they came, you know, made big plays out of one. But I guarantee you, I hadn't looked at the stats, but we probably didn't throw the ball 12 times a game. Right. And, and that's something, like you said, um, it was very much like Navy today um, in terms of, not a ton of receptions, but you you see um, an average of about twenty yards per reception. Oh yeah, because uh, they you know you you suck everybody on the run. The, the, the depend a, an option football team is assignment football. Everybody has an assignment, and if somebody misses their assignment, uh, then you know it's going to result into a big play. So you know we always most of our passes were off play action where we fake the option and and Leander would drop back and you know and and 
find his receivers. But uh, and and most of the time, you know, we didn't throw a whole lot of pocket, you know, set in the pocket, you know, and uh, five step drop stuff because of Leander's height. He wasn't very tall, so you had to sort of get him out on the edge, get him out behind the tackle, so you know he could see his receivers downfield. But they, that, that coaching staff did a great job, and uh, with the talent that we had and um, how we executed the offense and. And uh, the players, we took a lot of pride in it, and uh, I think that's what led to a lot of our success. And, and you referenced those yards per reception um, for um, Terry Gallagher, and you mentioned the big playability of Billy Ray Washington. And, and, and when I was looking through the numbers in the fact book, I know Billy Ray Washington averaged something like 27 yards per reception uh, in, the, in one of the seasons. Yeah, exactly right. Because you know, when when we had him attached and tied in, you had yet to play it honest, and uh, and then again, when you go back to assignment football, and you know they put you know Leander would stick the ball in in uh, Theo's you know belly and make a fake. You know he grew everybody sucked in to take the dive, and and then Leander would drop back, and you know it's just a would fake the belly option and. And then everybody's going to their assignment. Well, if you ain't careful, you're going to forget about the tight end. And uh, that led to Bill Ray being open quite a bit. I know Coach Pat Dye is obviously someone that meant, meant an awful lot to you. And I know when we were um, pre- preparing or actually setting up this interview, I should say, uh, you, you referenced um, how he had reached out to you in recent times in, in terms of uh, providing one of his Japanese maples from his uh, – from his farm down there in Auburn. Uh, so, so can you uh, talk a little bit about what Coach Dye means to you and then maybe sh- if there's a sh- story or two that you can share? Well, I'm, uh, you know, I still coach high school football, and, and the reason I do is because uh, the influence that Pat Dye had on my life. And, um, and you know, Coach Dye always told us, you know, and, uh, and I do talk to him periodically. And when my son played at Georgia, I would go down – to uh, watch the Auburn Georgia game, and you know, I'd always see, you know, have make arrangements to see Coach Dow when I was down there, and that's that's the story I'll share with you later. But the thing about it is, is Coach Dye, um he, he was a disciplinarian. Um, you know, if you played for Pat Dye, you 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 had to be disciplined. If you played for Pat Dye, you had to be mentally, physically tough. Um, you 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 had had to work hard every day. Um, and he had the unique talent of getting the most out of his players, and uh, and he loved you, and he knew he loved you. And Coach Dow has always said, you can coach him as hard as you love him, and when you do that, they'll do anything in the world for you. And and I've adopted that philosophy over my career. I, I coach kids hard, but they know I love them and I care about them. And Coach Dow, he cared, and you know, he cared about you, you know, off the field. It's, as well as on the field, and uh, he he was a genuine, awesome man. Still is. Uh, I did. Um, I had a friend of mine that was going who graduated from Auburn that I've met here at Topsail, and her and her husband both graduated from Auburn, and they were there back when Coach Styles was the head coach, and so they they he's an icon to them, and uh, so Melissa was going down to Auburn, and. Um, to visit her daughter who's in uh, doing her um, – she's on her internship in veterinary, veterinary medicine at Auburn. Anyway, she was going down to Auburn. Uh, I told her, I said, if you go down to Auburn, I need you to swim by Coach Dye's farm and get me uh, a Japanese maple because we had a storm last year, and I lost a couple of trees in my yard. And So I was going to replant them, and I was going to plant Japanese maples, and I, I knew about Coach Dye's farm and how he raised Japanese maples and – uh, so um, she said she would, and so I called Coach Dye up, and uh, he answered the phone, and he and I chatted and talked about the podcast in, in, in December, and uh, you know he talked about coaching, and I mean he he's just like he's never missed a lick, and uh, so I told him about my friend and that I would like to get a Japanese maple from him, and. He said, uh, hell, that's no problem. So he said, tell her to call me. So I, I, I give Melissa Pat Dye's number, and I said, Coach Dye wants you to call him. She said, you're kidding me. I said, no, he wants you to call him. She says, Coach, you're kidding. I said, no, call Coach Dye 
he'll set things up. And she did. I talk to her. She goes down there, her and her daughter, to uh, pick up the Japanese maples. He sent me two of them back. He sent me a, a green one and, and, and a red one and um, the plant in my yard. And uh, he even uh, had lunch with Melissa and, and her, her daughter. And um, she said it's, it's, it's one of the most precious experiences she ever had. And Coach Ty, that's just who he is. You know, he's just a genuine good person, and uh, people see that in him, and that's why he's so loved, you know, by the East Carolina alumni as well as uh, the Auburn University. Absolutely. I can imagine how much that meant to an Auburn alum. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. But um, next thing I wanted to ask you is uh, you referencing how you're in coaching. Uh, was, was it Coach Dye's influence that really made you – make that decision to go into teaching and coaching? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Be, being around him and, and, and our program at, uh, at East Carolina and how they, they taught you to play the game um, and the influence that they had on me, you know, I've always said, you know, I'll, you know, you, you don't get rich being a high school football coach, but you can touch a lot of young men's lives. And, and Coach Dye and his staff touched my life. They influence me, and if I can pass it forward, that's that's what I do. And I've been very fortunate to coach some great young men, and, and uh, these 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 kids, even after they leave you, you know, they still call you and talk to you just like I love to call Coach Dye and talk to him. So we we just pass it forward. I know earlier uh, you talked about um, your alma mater is Hope Mill Southview. Yeah, I know you spent some time as an assistant there, and then also at Terry Sanford, and then you spent. But nine seasons as the head coach at Terry Stanford, and now you're entering your seventh year at Topsail. Yep, that, that, that's uh, this has been football's been part of my life for a long time. I started playing the game when I was eight years old, um, in, in a little town called Hope Mills, and we had two teams. We had the red team and the yellow team, and we played each other every Saturday. And uh, I started playing when I was eight, and I've been involved in the game ever since, and I've, I've just turned. 61 today so it's been a big part of my life both my boys um had opportunity to play college football one at university of georgia and you know, it was a four-year starter there and then my other son played at university of north carolina pembroke and you know had a great career there himself and um so uh football has been good to my family and um we can um i don't think we can ever give back to the game what the game has uh given us over the years and uh, and lastly, uh, that's what with your team this year at Topsail, uh, tell us a little bit about um, the outlook for you guys. And I know you're getting things cranked up, and you'll have practice here shortly this evening and uh, opener next week. Yeah, we open up next Friday night uh, over at Heidi Trask, and uh, which they got a new coach, and that's going to be a little test for us. But you know, we we've. Uh, we we enjoy it here. It's a good place, good good community to live in. It's, we're we're down at the beach, so we when you, when things get too intense, you can always just go walk on the beach and gather your thoughts. But uh, we we've enjoyed building things here, and that, and uh, we went from the school went from a little one A two A school. Now we're playing a three A four conference, and uh, we we started out when I got here. We might have had you know we had twenty eight kids on the varsity, maybe nineteen on the JVs, and now. Uh, I think I looked at the eligibility list yesterday, and we've got 105 kids now on our roster, which is is huge. Um, but uh, we, we're gonna be okay. We went 93 last year, which is big for us, and uh, and we we know who our competition is, so we have to prepare every week to uh, you know try to beat those guys. And, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. We we uh, we got a lot of good kids, and and uh, it's, I, I I do hear what I've I did when I played. We work hard. You know, we work hard and, and try to get mentally and physically tough and uh, so we uh, can compete. And that's the big thing is you want to compete on Friday night. And, and I think that's Coach Houston. That's what the big thing is going to be with him at East Carolina this year is, is uh, he's going to put a product on the field that can compete. And and I, a moment ago, I know I said lastly, but um, – that's something I certainly want to get your thoughts on before we uh, before we go. You're talking about Coach Houston and his tremendous track record and how he'll certainly bring a, a product that is much more competitive this year uh, to East Carolina. So um, 
So just taking a look at things at large, um, how do you feel? I mean, you have guys like Donnie Kirkpatrick and Steve Shankweiler uh, coming back at the program, and this this staff as a whole is just so proven. Well, I'll, 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 I'll share this with you. I don't think any head coach is successful without surrounding himself with good people, and I think that that's one of the things that Coach Dye did. Uh, that, that's that's one of the things that uh, Nick Saban does. And uh, that's something that uh, Coach Houston's doing. He's he's got good coaches on his staff and uh, that know how to coach the game of football. So I think that's number one. The number two thing is I think uh, Coach Houston's done things the right way. He he's, he he does he does it through hard work and commitment and dedication, and he did it. Uh, he's done it throughout his, uh, his college career and did it at James Madison and. Uh, you know, he'll continue to do it at East Carolina. You know, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what we will see. I don't know but when, when it comes to wins and losses, but what you will see when you watch East Carolina play this year is you'll see a competitive football team that goes out there and competes. And, uh, and uh, I think that's, that's where he's at. And, um, he, but he's gotten, you know, good people around him. And Coach Dye used to say back in the day that, you know, you couldn't out recruit Carolina and, and State and South Carolina and Clemson. You just had to out coach them, and uh, I think that that's what Coach Houston will do. I think that they will outwork uh, his opponent. Absolutely, I, I fully expect to see a much more competitive product on the field this year. And then, if it doesn't, or if it is not reflected in the wins and losses this year, it most definitely will be down the road. Uh, well, Coach, we certainly appreciate your time. Um, best of luck to to you and the Topsail Pirates this year. I uh, hope to run into you in Greenville, and we'd love to have you back on down the road. Hey, anytime, Bubba, and I've, I've enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. That concludes this edition of 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective. Remember, join us daily between now and game day as we'll talk pirate football with players from various eras. All these interviews are available exclusively on SoundCloud and our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and follow so you're alerted when we post new content. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, Go Pirates!